it's a Vulcan neck pinch. Knowing the right tool, or having the right trick, I mean, so that you can knock a sucker out with minimum effort and that stone cold swagger. So this one's all about the tools. There it is, bane of my existence. Trouble getting parts has meant I had to give up on getting this car back on four wheels permanently at the 11th hour. So I figure best way to make this one interesting is to give a little background. I couldn't underseal this car until everything was fully painted and everything couldn't be fully painted until everything was fully repaired. And there are a number of sheet metal repairs I made off camera just to speed things up. Well, that worked. Two of those were in the near side upper portion of the inner arch where the arch liner screwed in. Some small holes for the fasteners had turned into big holes. So I've got some new stainless steel hex headed self tappers. These are 4.8 mil and some big penny washers. And by the way, when you're trying to spec fasteners, you really need a pair of calipers and some thread gauges. Anyway, all I have to do here is make some new holes with a drill and then file them out so that I can fit the little fastener grommet into them. Then we can paint, then we can underseal, then we can have a snack. So all the standing between me and this car being rolling once and for all is a full overhaul of the front suspension and I wasn't looking forward to this. But every fastener that came off here, certainly every bolt, was thread locked and it has to keep the moisture out of the threads. So each one came out smoothly. And to my surprise, every ball joint, well every one on the near side anyway, came out no problem. And if you ask me, this is the go-to universal ball joint splitter. And a word to the wise, something I learned on this build, they are not all the same. And the key factor is the opening of the jaw, the part that goes round the taper of the ball joint. My one had a 16 mil wide jaw and it just wouldn't go round the bottom ball joints on the hub. Where it counts, the taper on the ball joint is around 20 mil. So I had to go onto the funny pages and find myself another one. And I bought a kit and I came with one of these splitters with a 22 mil jaw. And that made the job a cinch. We'll see that later on. But for now, let's get on with some disassembly and some prep. It almost goes without saying, throughout this video and throughout any build, a decent hammer is an absolute must. And in a section where I want to tell you that, as far as I'm concerned, a claw hammer has no place in a mechanic's toolbox, I still managed to catch this ball peen in some of the brake wiring. Hammering on the side of ball joint tapers is a no-brainer because the odd time that they do just release easily, it's a joy. I personally would prefer to go at them with a proper tool, i.e. a ball joint splitter, than just reaching for a bigger hammer, which is not guaranteed to work and runs the greater risk of damaging something. 
in terms of tooling up from scratch, from ground zero, a decent ball peen hammer has to be a contender for tool number one. And tool number two is a decent vice. You'll see just how much that gets used. But here's a good one. It's all good and well having thread locked and protected fastener threads, but that won't do you any good if you can't grip the fastener to get it out. I couldn't tell what kind of fastener this was supposed to be holding the bottom end of the dampers on. Turns out originally this should have had a 12 point head. There was no semblance of that left. And really, now that I've learned to do it, I'd almost say tool number three is a welder. Because even for stuff like this, where you just don't know how you're going to get in without destroying everything, it is a simple joy. Just break out the welder for a second and apply heat as well as affixing a new head to a fastener and then just winding it out. Okay, this is important. There are tools to measure the load you put on a wheel bearing to get it right so you're not binding it up, you're not putting too much pressure on it, but we don't have those. So we've got to take stock of how tight these wheel bearings are before we separate them from the hub. And you can see when I'm spinning it, there is a small amount of free wheel and crucially, the disc comes to a halt gently and smoothly. There is no play whatsoever in these bearings. So we've got to try and replicate that by feel when we get to the reassembly end of things. bushes on the inner end of the lower control arm. I've seen people drifting these out with a hammer and chisel, but that just was not cutting the mustard here. So in the end, I just gripped them hard in the vise and used the control arm against itself. Judo chop. I find myself using a cold chisel all the time. I use it when I'm welding to hold parts, to put pressure on parts, to reform parts. And like this, I use it to knock off heavy corrosion because even the knotted wire wheel, which is what I use to do most of my metal prep, and it does need to be this knotted type. The straight wire cup wheel is just not gonna last. While it will go through this, it will take a hell of a lot longer and wear out the wheel. So a cold chisel is a much quicker option if you need to knock off heavy corrosion or dirt. And that's one of those tools you can buy for pennies, whether it's online or at an auto jumble or wherever you might find it. greatest general purpose degreaser I've ever found, let's say in terms of economy and effectiveness, is just neat fuel, petrol or gasoline, depending on where you're sniffing it. It has its limitations. I mean, off the top of my head, it will destroy surgical gloves. It will strip paint off components if you work them too long, but it does cut most things and it doesn't have an unpleasant fragrance, if you know what I mean. Don't sniff petrol. In case you're wondering, these bearings are being reused. There was nothing wrong with them. Had I not started ripping off the front suspension of this car, they would have soldiered on for plenty more miles. And I don't believe in waste. A 
bench grinder is, I think, the best way, unless you've got a tumbler or something like that, to clean up fasteners. Just make sure that you bury it behind a large piece of machinery that you can't move and under some more machinery so that you can barely tow up to it and it's awkward and dangerous to use. So I'm gonna put these cleaned up hubs away for now because it's the bearing seals that have held up this whole build. And by the way, never throw out an old toothbrush. They make great degreasing brushes for those small intricate jobs. This was out of shot on the near side of the car, but this is how I presume the toe out is adjusted on a Mercedes W123. The lower arm has a cammed washer at either end that depending on its placement will make a big difference to the position of the lower arm. So before we undo it, you see I've used the chisel to mark the washer against the mount it's in. So we know where to adjust it to on reassembly. So all the steering links and their ball joints, I've measured everything so that I know roughly where it needs to go back to. I'm not going to be able to set up this car perfectly. It will have to be tracked. But just to get it that far, we can get it into the ballpark. And while we're making the alignment dude's job a little bit easier, let's just make sure that all these ball joints, which again, I'm going to reuse because they're fine, are free in their threads. From my own reference, I thought it'd be a bit of fun to mark each one of them so I know which side of the car came from and which way around it's orientated. I used a standard set of number and letter punches. And no, me having... It's not, it's not dodgy. Right? Top front suspension arms on the Mercedes 123 are aluminium and so are a complete replacement item. You cannot safely press the bushes out of the inboard end of them. So they come out and await a brand new set. And as I go to clean off the road dirt from the inner arch, there's another set of tools that I don't use that often but are very handy. And those are standard wire brushes that will fit in a cordless drill. They're very cheap, they're available almost anywhere and they come in a range of sizes, which is a crucial thing. It means that they get into places that the knotted wheel on the grinder or the grinder in general just won't get into. They're not nearly as effective in general, but for stuff like this where it's only light duty work, they can make all the difference. You can look at it this way. A manual wire brush is a fine thing insofar as it's a fine thing. A wire brush and a drill is like the turbo version of the manual brush. And then a knotted wheel on a grinder is the twin turbo supercharged version of the wire wheel in the drill.
And speaking of abrasive devices, now that we're finally into that metal work that I did in the front end, a finger sander, whether it be pneumatic or electric, is just a brilliant thing. It's great for cleaning up the edges of an area that's about to be welded. It's great for getting into tiny little nooks and crannies. And with a 40 grit belt on it, it will make short work of grinding down hard to reach welds. Something else that crops up is how do I cut out rust without damaging surrounding panels? I don't. There's no weld that goes smoother than a piece of metal that you've zipped but not cut away. But obviously the less you do that the better. Something I've learned to do is not grind all of my discs down to nothing. Stop and keep discs that are a smaller size because they will come in handy for very tight places. Now, the single question I get asked more than any other is, what is the paint that I use when I'm prepping the places I've repaired? I gotta tell you, I am not a person to take paint advice for, and anyone who asks me is told that before I give the answer. The paint I use, it's a brush on over rust primer made by a crowd called Low. I have no affiliation, I don't have very much experience with it, but what I do know about it is, it goes on thick. It's one of these paints that's designed to go over rust. So I consider most of my stuff over prepared and it dries exceptionally quickly. And once I've given at least two coats of that, I just hit it with whatever oil based top coat the hardware store has in stock. Like I say, not a paint expert. If I had my way, I would do everything the way the Esprit chassis has been done and I would epoxy prime before doing anything else. And that is what eventually I will tool up to do. I have treated all of my builds so far as an experiment in that regard. And that's the reason why the last section to paint you see on this car is battleship grey gloss. Running low on supplies, that is all I could find in the shed. Copy my paint regime at your own risk and discretion. What I've done here, by the way, is brush off all the road dirt, make all the repairs, seal them with primer and paint. But where the original stone chip from the factory, the under seal is in good condition, it's in good condition. So I'm not gonna start stripping it now. This is not that type of restoration. I'm going to clean it and prep it and almost scarf the new paint up to it before hitting everything with a fresh layer of under seal. Okay, ball joints. Eastwood very kindly sent me this ball joint kit. It's not the biggest, it's not the smallest, but it's a great price. And there's no way I would have gotten these ball joints back into the hubs without it. The first thing you've got to do is take the boots off the ball joints and remove the grease. Now I'd love to know, was it only a token amount of grease in these ball joints because they knew proper practice would be to take the grease out and then reapply, or were they just cheaping out? It didn't take long to find the right combination of cups and shims to get the ball joint splitter onto these joints. And you could do this with an impact gun, but I don't have one of those. So I made an educated guess that I would be able to get enough leverage on a breaker bar to achieve this. This breaker bar, by the way, it's one of my newest tools. I bought it right at the beginning of this build to help get the rear subframe bolts out of this car. And it has just been such a go-to thing ever since. I don't know how I survived without one.
oh yeah that's that's weirdly that's kind of weirdly satisfying squishy ball joint squishy squishy ball joint i can see the grease in there <laughs> weird so that's it really massive dejection i would love to just put these beautiful looking uprights back on the car throw the hubs and discs back on and see what the damn thing looks like with a 50 millimeter lowering job i shouldn't complain it's taken three years for my first experience getting bitten by a simple component that you would think would be very easy to source but that's just the way the wheel bearing crumbles the next time by hook or by crook well it's going to be the last episode on the w123 because i've already started a new project in the background check out my website for your work clothes because who wants to pay big bucks to get oily the link for that's below and if supporting the channel is something you'd like to do you can sign up at patreon or directly through paypal again all of the links are on my website and you'll find that in the description there is a savage list of patrons this time thanks in part to shout outs from two people mark at grand blogismo he is just starting an esprit s2 restoration a car identical to mine so check that out and ronnie finger he's ronald finger on youtube and he's been restoring his pontiac fiero he really thinks about his videos there is a guy who's just at home learning to do it himself and everything he does on his car is just perfect it's actually incredible so check out his channel he's done this channel a massive favor and we owe him one so thanks chaps and are you ready for this thanks to my patrons ray algwin stefan ingemarsson liam kilcullen mark kranich andreas ryan neville aid saint david mako john magnani michael byrne patrick bobbitt simon richardson ricardo almeida chris slatter hatim el chiari casper rengley ushin quigley tuomo pitcannon jerry carroll leopold plassart michael otati peter johnston jan van eggman christian morgan nicholas bergen robert backer james quigley r buchan jason angelino michael roach brandon lambert guillaume vidal florian aberl mark richardson david womack bjorn <laughs> Bjorn Nyland, Glenn Spivey, David fixes his shit. <laughs> you did that on purpose. Alan Schultz, Ayman Ahmed, Catherine Fortunato, James Hepburn, Dan Van Zyl, Sam Buck, Peter Keller, Noel Byrne, Chuck Millarns, Russell Kelly, Nigel Smith, Roger Ritchie. I'm going horse. That's not a name. I am actually going horse. Stuart K, Diego Ubrina Lebron, Jonas Magnuson, Jacob Stein, Jay Bruno, Mark Rollinson, Steve Williams. John Hawkins, Albin Sigonius, Philip Holland, Lars Fair Erickson, Andrew Cochran, Robert Eccles, Jason Chapman, Douglas, Steve Matthews, Dirk Gatsby, Sean Turley, ZN, Eric Moe, Gordon Hack, Adrian Hoopen, Brad Hopper, Adam Clash, Michael Steves, Anson Stewart, Chase Ivany, Ricky Shields, Mark Hooser, Peter Symes, Mustard Caviar, Yummy, Daniel Waugh, Semidori Kim, Brendan Sheedy, Lee Packer, Daniel Kedney, Donald Molaro, Gavin Matheson, Peter Beaumont, Vince Den Hertog, Dan, and Rickard Klingberg. Woo! Amazing. Thank you so much. Just a step closer to the goal which is to build myself a workshop. It is literally a dream. I'll catch you on the upswing. Until then, stay on it, stay stuck in, and good luck.